Nashville, Tennessee, April 11, 2005. It was just past 4 p.m. when someone knocked on Ray Jean Beverly's door. When Ray Jean opened the door, her neighbor Martha Freeman rushed in without even looking her in the eyes and immediately blurted out that her husband Jeffrey had been killed. Ray Jean hurriedly dialed 911 and reported that an armed man had attacked her neighbors. It took the police only a few minutes to surround the Freeman's house. However, the SWAT team that stormed in found no signs of violence, no unknown assailant or Jeffrey, until they entered the master bathroom. The lifeless body of a man protruded from a sleeping bag with a plastic bag over his head and his entire body covered in bruises. Jeffrey Freeman had been bound, beaten, and then strangled. But how did his killer manage to disappear so quickly, and why did he allow Martha to escape? Martha Cockrell, 30 years old, and Jeffrey Freeman, 34 years old, met in 1995. Martha worked at a Nashville newspaper, was a very friendly woman, skilled at breaking the ice when meeting people, and she had no trouble winning Jeffrey over, who was one of her advertisers. At first glance, it was clear that Martha and Jeffrey were a perfect match. In March 1994, the couple had a very modest wedding ceremony, and just a few weeks later, they purchased a new home in one of America's finest neighborhoods, Brentwood, a southern suburb of Nashville. After some time, Martha took a risk and changed her career path. She left her job at the newspaper, obtained a private detective license, and founded her own company, Resifax. Employers and landlords turned to her to check the financial stability and credit history of potential employees or tenants. Initially, the entire company consisted of one employee, Martha, who worked day and night in the guest bedroom of her home. But soon, the company began to grow, moved into a business center, and had two employees, with Jeffrey joining in 2003. As the business expanded, Jeffrey took on more responsibilities, devoting himself entirely to work, which allowed Martha more free time. Soon, her daily routine underwent significant changes, but that wasn't the only thing that changed. Usually a happy and optimistic person, Martha stopped being herself. She would fluctuate between cheerful moods and periods of depression without understanding why. Fortunately, her doctor understood, and in 2004, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Learning that there was a logical explanation for her sudden mood swings, Martha even felt somewhat relieved. She followed her doctor's treatment recommendations and decided to spend less time working and more with her family, especially her elderly mother who had diabetes. However, when her mother passed away a year later, it deeply affected Martha. She started taking more medication, distanced herself from friends, and spent a lot of time in her late mother's room. Jeffrey was very concerned about his wife's health and supported her in every way possible. He took on all the household chores and worked tirelessly, often even on weekends. Despite his busy schedule, he dedicated every free moment to his wife, trying to help her relax and not sink into depression. The two of them traveled, attended concerts and music festivals. This was the case on July 4, 2004, when the entire country celebrated Independence Day. The spouses arrived in Nashville with plans to have a night out, watch the fireworks, and stay at a hotel. However, Jeffrey, tired after a long week at the office, could barely stay awake until nightfall. He admitted to his wife that he just wanted to go home. Martha, who had forgotten about her depression for the first time in months, didn't want the evening to end. The couple had an argument and Jeffrey went home, leaving Martha to spend the night in the city. But the night without her husband and the newfound independence marked a turning point in their marriage. Just a month later, Martha left their home and moved into a motel. She wanted some time alone to find herself. While still being a devoted husband, Jeffrey supported his wife's decision. He took care of her needs and paid for her motel room. However, in reality, Martha needed more than just personal space. This is because at the motel, she was living not alone but with an undocumented immigrant from Mexico, whom she called Christian. The man didn't speak English, and Martha didn't know Spanish. But that didn't matter because Martha was interested in more than just conversation with the man. Six months later, Jeffrey noticed that he was paying for two people's expenses, and in January 2005, he went to see his wife at the motel. However, he didn't come looking for a fight. On the contrary, he came to persuade Martha to return home. Martha realized that she had been behaving poorly towards her husband and agreed to give their marriage another chance. Fortunately, Christian also took the situation quite calmly. He didn't create any scenes that Martha had feared. Martha returned home, 
and one thing that stood out from the ideal picture was that the spouses slept in separate rooms on different floors. Nevertheless, to the neighbors, it seemed like the family's life had returned to its usual course. Redfin Beverly's neighbor, Martha Freeman, was shocked when, on April 11th, just three months after the family reunited, Martha came running to her house, screaming that her husband had been killed. Redfin asked if she had called the police, and when Martha replied no, Redfin dialed 911 herself. Due to Martha's confusing account, she reported that an armed intruder with a shotgun was still inside the neighbor's house. However, when the SWAT team entered, there were no signs of an intruder. Jeffrey was found on the second floor. He had indeed been killed, but not by a gunshot. He had been bound, beaten, strangled, and then inexplicably unbound. He was soaked and lay in a sleeping bag right in the middle of the bathroom. Surprisingly, the house was impeccably clean, and if it weren't for the body, there was nothing to suggest a murder. However, what was even more astonishing was that the body was cold, indicating that the crime had occurred several hours earlier. The clean house and Jeffrey's body didn't fit with the sudden attack on the family, so investigators turned to Martha Freeman for explanations. Unlike Jeffrey, she had no bruises on her. Surprisingly, she was composed and provided an accurate description of the assailant. She stated that nobody had broken into the house and she knew who the killer was. The only thing she didn't know was his whereabouts. However, if Martha didn't know, her neighbors did. They had seen a man running down the road who had jumped into a partially constructed house. Officers had no trouble arresting the man hiding there. He didn't speak English, but he matched Martha's description. When they brought him to the police car where a woman was sitting, she immediately identified him. Christian, whose real name was Rachel Rocha Perez, was charged with murder. He refused to cooperate with the police. Martha, on the other hand, was quite talkative. She revealed that she had known Perez since July and had been living with him in a motel for several months. However, she confessed that her decision to return to her husband did not mark the end of her affair. About a month ago, her lover secretly entered the family's house and had been hiding in the closet. When Jeffrey was not at home, Perez could move around the house. But in the presence of Martha's husband, he tried to remain as quiet as possible. It's remarkable that the lovers managed to keep Perez's presence in the house a secret for an entire month. However, the previous night, Christian accidentally revealed his presence to Jeffrey. When Jeffrey entered Martha's room, he heard snoring coming from her closet. After opening the door, he found Christian inside. Jeffrey informed the lovers that he would take the dog for a walk and that when he returned, Perez should no longer be in the house. Otherwise, he would call the police. According to Martha, this infuriated her lover, and upon Jeffrey's return, Perez dragged him into the bathroom and locked the door. She heard sounds of a struggle and splashing water, after which it became eerily quiet. Her husband had been killed. Martha spent most of the day in a state of shock and horror while Perez cleaned up the crime scene. She was afraid to even think about what he might do to her after killing her husband. The investigators gathered evidence at the crime scene that corroborated Martha's account of her lover hiding in the closet. They found a mattress, a blanket, magazines in Spanish, men's clothing, as well as a bag containing provocative lingerie, explicit photos of Martha, and adult toys. Additionally, the police discovered the shotgun and signs that someone had cleaned up the house, including trash bags, gloves, and a wet towel. On the first floor, in the living room, there was a beach towel spread out on the floor, which they initially believed had been used for cleaning. However, this towel would later prove to be a crucial piece of evidence. Five days after the murder of Jeffrey Martin, Martha appeared in the courtroom for a preliminary hearing. She was the main witness against Perez. Martha described what was already known about Perez's attack on Jeffrey. However, her story became less convincing when she described her affair with a lover. Martha calmly recounted how she had met him on Independence Day while her tired husband went home. Christian was with two friends, and Martha invited all three to go to a hotel and have fun. At the hotel, she engaged in intimate relations with all three strangers. Martha's confession shocked everyone in the courtroom, including the judge. But everyone was even more shocked when Perez's lawyer began to press her, demanding an answer to why she waited nearly 18 hours to report the murder. Did Perez not get distracted for a minute during those 18 hours while her husband lay dead in the bathroom cleaning the house so she could dial 911? Martha had no answer to this question, but she didn't have to answer it because something extraordinary happened. 
The judge interrupted the trial, stating that he didn't understand why Martha was present in the courtroom as a witness and not as a defendant. He wasn't sure of her guilt, but advised her to think about getting a lawyer to protect her constitutional rights. The judge's words prompted the police to take a closer look at Martha's role in the case. First and foremost, they obtained the phone records of both Martha and Jeffrey, which led to a significant breakthrough. On the night of Jeffrey's death, someone called his mother at 11 p.m. This wasn't unusual because he always called his mother on Sunday evenings. However, it was Martha who made the call that night. She explained to her mother-in-law that Jeffrey wasn't feeling well, had taken medicine, and had gone to sleep, so he wouldn't be able to talk as usual. According to Jeffrey's mother, Martha sounded completely calm. However, forensic analysis didn't find any drugs in Jeffrey's system. The next morning, Martha picked up the phone again and called her workplace to inform them that her husband would be taking the day off. Once again, her voice sounded perfectly calm. What's more, while her husband lay dead in the bathroom, Martha left the house twice, once to walk the dog and once to go to the pharmacy. In other words, if she had wanted to, Martha could have reported the crime to the police. However, she didn't do so. Furthermore, it appeared that she had likely engaged in sexual activity with her lover on the living room floor after Jeffrey was killed. Forensic analysis of the beach towel spread on the living room floor revealed Perez's semen and Martha's DNA. Consequently, four months after Jeffrey's death, Martha was also charged with murder. The trial began on December 25, 2006. Martha and her lover were tried simultaneously. This was a tactic employed by the prosecutors to make the accused point fingers at each other. According to the prosecutors, the motive behind the crime was money. Due to their romantic involvement and Martha's mental state, she would never be able to keep the business in case of a divorce. Therefore, the accomplices killed Jeffrey, put him in a bag, and cleaned up the house. But they couldn't get rid of the body. Time was running out as a repairman was expected to arrive any minute. That's when Martha panicked and went with Plan B, fleeing to her neighbor's house. The prosecution had virtually no evidence implicating both accomplices in the crime. The jury could have acquitted both Martha and Perez. Additionally, the judge decided to exclude the shocking details of Martha's intimate life from the case. The jurors didn't hear them, but that was not necessary since the prosecutor's tactics worked perfectly. The defense lawyers constantly shifted blame onto the other side, which was exactly what the prosecutors needed. On September 28, 2006, the jury found both defendants guilty. They were automatically sentenced to life imprisonment. According to Tennessee law, they would have to serve 51 years before they could even be considered for parole. Martha filed an appeal, accusing her lawyer of poor performance. It turns out the prosecutors had offered her a deal, 20 years in exchange for her testimony against Perez. However, her lawyer advised against it. If she had agreed, she could have been released in just a few years. Her last appeal in June 2020 was denied. Now, Martha can only be eligible for parole in 2064 when she turns 100 years old. 